Thank you for listening to this message from Simple Truth Gospel with Kiria, a teaching ministry that teaches the Word of God verse by verse to help you grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Welcome to Simple Truth Gospel with Kirian. Today, we will continue our study through the book of the Romans. So we will cover Romans chapter 4. Let's pray together before we continue. Heavenly Father, we all agree as touching this today. I thank you for the opportunity for us to gather to glean from your word. You say that if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. So we ask, Father God, that you will teach us today by your Holy Spirit. You will give us revelation, knowledge, understanding of the truth. That you will minister to everyone simultaneously today and give us what you want us to receive from today's teaching. Help us to always be a light to our word. Help us to always reach people through our mannerisms. Help us to be doers of the word of God and not hearers only. Heavenly Father, we pray that you will help us not to lean to our own understanding, but to acknowledge you in all our ways so that you will direct our path for us. Help us not to lean on that righteousness that comes by works, rather that we should lean upon the righteousness that is by faith alone. You've done so much for us. We are very grateful. We thank you and we say all glory, honor, and power belong to you forever and ever in the name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said, Amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. My good friends, we'll continue our study today and we will cover Romans chapter 4. We'll go ahead and start. You remember so far... Paul has been talking about the wrath of God that will come upon those that are not born again. Last week, we covered chapter 3, and when we got to verse 21, Paul introduced a game-changing phrase. A phrase that is used about 45 times in the scriptures. And that phrase is, but God. You do not have to face the wrath of God. This is why God made a provision. But God made a provision through Jesus Christ so that you do not have to face the punishment of God if you will receive what Jesus Christ did for you and I. You see, have you ever have have you ever had um, but God moments in your life? That moment when you see, it looks like everything is working against you. When it looks like you are hemmed in. The time when you faced that unfavorable odd. But God all of a sudden showed up. And everything changed. You see, if God, if he had, he had ever shown up in your life in a moment like this, he will show up again and again and again. And I pray that God will show up in your situation even today in the name of Jesus Christ. Because he is able to make all grace abound towards you. He's able to make all things work together for your own good. But he, you have to trust him by faith. Let's go ahead and start. Verse 1. What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For Abraham was justified by works. For if Abraham was justified by works... He has something to boast about, but not before God. 
But what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. You remember last week, towards the end, there was a question that Paul asked. He said, since we are not justified by works or by the law, but by faith, do we then abolish the law? That was the question. He answered the question by saying, no, certainly not. He said, we do not abolish the law, rather we establish the law. You see, the law does not contradict righteousness by faith. Rather, it talks about righteousness by faith. It's just like some people don't see it when they read the Old Testament. So because of this, to prove that uh, the law talks about righteousness by faith, Paul brings two witnesses from the Old Testament. Abraham, the father of faith, and David. These are the people that the Jews looked up to. You see, Abraham was not justified because when God told him to leave his father's house and go to the uh, 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 place that he will show him, that country. That's not why Abraham was justified. If Abraham was justified because of that obedience, he would have boasted. He would have the right to boast and say, after all, when God asked me to leave, I left. Just like when you work for your paycheck, you know, and you get the money, you can boast and say, I work for this money. This is my money. But then, when was Abraham justified when did he believe god we find this in genesis chapter 15. you remember god appeared to abraham in a vision and he said to abraham do not be afraid i am your shield and your exceedingly great reward and abraham said to god what will you give me knowing that i go childless behold Eliezer from Damascus is going to be my heir. I'm paraphrasing now. So God told Abraham, no, he's not going to be your heir. Rather, someone from you will be your heir. Talking about Isaac here. Abraham believed what God said at that time. God took Abraham outside. And he told him to look up in the sky, in the, in the, in the sky, and, uh, and look at the, the stars. And he asked Abraham, if you were able to count the number of the, 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 the stars in the sky, so shall your descendant be. And the Bible tells us that Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him as righteousness. This is when Abraham was uh, 86 years old. Now, the word believe, it means to lean on somebody with your full weight. Just like you leaning on somebody with your full weight, before you do this, you must make sure that it's someone that you trust. <laughs> Otherwise, it will be disastrous when they move. This is what Abraham did by faith. And the Bible says it was imputed. That, was, that word imputed there is an accounting term. It's just like you are crediting the, a, a ledger. So, that's what Abraham did. Everything that we receive from God, my good friends, from salvation, 
to the blessings of God in our lives, to his forgiveness and his mercies that are new every morning in our lives. Everything that we receive from God, they are all by grace. They are not by works. If you think that God has been blessing you because of how good you were, what about the time when you miss it? Does God strip his blessings from you? No, he doesn't. So it's a good thing for us to understand that whatever we receive from God is because of his grace towards us. So that we will continue to have the peace of God in us. So that we will not be scared of God, but we will look at God as our father. And even when we miss the mark, we ask him for forgiveness. And the Bible tells us that he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the law also serves the purpose of bringing people to the end of themselves, even up till today. Those ones who are not yet born again, the law still serves the purpose of uh, showing them how sinful they are. And then uh, bringing the knowledge to them that they need a savior. And that savior is Jesus Christ. We have to study to show ourselves approved unto God. So that we can rightfully divide the word of truth. Which means we have to know the scriptures. Now, you know that we do not offer animal sacrifices any longer just to cover sins. Just like they did in the Old Testament. Because Jesus Christ now has fulfilled this part of the Old Testament. So we do not have to do that anymore. We continue with um, verse um, 6. Just as David also described the blessedness of the man whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. This is the second witness, like I told you, Paul brought two witnesses from the Old Testament just to tell us that uh, the Old Testament contains righteousness by faith. So now it's David. Paul here is quoting from Psalm 32, verse 1 and 2. You remember when David sinned with Bathsheba and killed uh, her husband Uri just to cover up the crime. The hand of Lord of the Lord was heavy upon him after he sinned. He was restless. God sent prophet Nathan to go and confront David and talk to him about his sin. After Nathan spoke to David, David confessed his sins to God. And you will see this in uh, Psalm 32 and also in Psalm 51, a very, a very popular psalm that uh, most of us know by heart. So when David confessed his sin to God, blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, he was forgiven. That uh, heaviness upon him was lifted. Friends, you know this translates into salvation today. I see a corollary here when it comes to salvation. Regardless of your past, regardless of how sinful you were, regardless of whatever you did in the past, the moment you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, God imputes righteousness unto you that day as if to say that you never sinned. That day, God will cleanse you from every unrighteousness 
and that day he will make you his own righteousness. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are now in verse 9. Does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only? Or upon the uncircumcised also? For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it accounted? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of righteousness of the faith, which he had while still uncircumcised. And he might be the father of all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness may be imputed to them also. And the father of circumcision to those who not only are of circumcision, but, also, but who also walk in the steps of the faith, which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. So, so far we say that Abraham was justified by faith, not by works or by the law. Now he's going to add something to it. Circumcision. So he tells us here, Abraham was not justified because he was circumcised. As a matter of fact, circumcision came 14 years after he was declared the righteousness of God. Circumcision was not given, the law of circumcision was not given to the Jews for another 400 years or more. What is, then, what is circumcision then? Circumcision is just simple, a seal, an outward seal of the covenant which God made with Abraham. The covenant which when Abraham believed, you know the covenant when God promised him that uh, he is going to make him the father of all the nations, that uh, blessings will come to the world through his seed. When he took him outside and uh, showed him the stars in the sky and told him so shall his descendants be and abraham believed it was counted unto him as righteousness so circumcision is just an outward seal of that covenant which god had with abraham it is just an act of obedience just like we have baptism today baptism is an Outward expression of an inward change is an outward manifestation of someone being born again. So you get born again first, then you are baptized to show the word what happened inside. So Abraham is the father of all nations. Those who believe by faith alone, not by works. This is why we say Abraham is the father of faith. That's what it means. Regardless of your background, whether you were a Jew or a Gentile, as long as you believe what Jesus Christ did, you can say Abraham is our father. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We continue now to make progress. I think we are now in verse uh, 13. For the promise that he would be the heir of the word was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect. Because the law brings about wrath. For where there is no law, there is no transgression. What is he saying here? You see, Abraham was justified because of faith. Not because of keeping the law or by works. 
I continue to emphasize this because it's very important in this teaching. Here, Paul brings another purpose of the law. That purpose is to make sin punishable for that one who does not believe. That one who wants to work. Who wants to depend upon works instead of faith in Christ Jesus. The law makes it possible that that one can be punished. Because without the law, there will not be any transgression recorded against that one. It says sin was in the world before the law was given. But sin was not imputed against man. Why? Because without the law, there is no transgression. Just like the man who was gathering sticks uh, um, on a Sabbath day. After the law was given to keep the Sabbath day holy. That man was stoned to death. Why? Because now the law was given to keep the Sabbath day holy. And he went outside. He was gathering sticks on the Sabbath day. And uh, the Lord commanded that he should be put to death. Because now, there is a law there that makes it possible for him to be punished. Another example is if you go to Germany, there is a place called the Autobahn. In that place is an expressway. You can travel as fast as you want to in that area. You see, the police is not going to stop you and give you a ticket or citation because you are going too fast. For the simple reason, there is no speed limit there, so you can go as fast as you want. You will not be charged for transgression. Now, what is transgression, by the way? Transgression means that you deliberately committed an offense. That's what it means. It means that uh, you are aware a law has been given, but you intentionally broke that law. Let me give you an example. When you are traveling on the road, you will see like speed limits. And they will tell you like uh, 45 miles per hour. That's how far you're supposed to go in that area. You may decide to go 55 miles per hour or 60 miles per hour. That is your choice. Don't do that. But let's assume that you are going 60 miles per hour on 45 miles per hour road. The police will pull you over. And when they pull you over, it's transgression. Because you, the sign is there. You are where the sign is there, but you decided to go 60 miles per hour anyway. So, in this case, the police has every right to give you a citation for breaking that law. That's what a, a transgression means. Now, what is what is the, what what is sin? Sin means missing the mark. That's what it means. So missing the mark means that a, a, a standard has been set. And as long as you don't miss, you don't miss that standard, means that you miss the, the whole thing. Regardless of how close you came to meeting that standard, you still miss the mark. Let's assume that we I have uh, 20 arrows and you have 20 arrows. And we are supposed to shoot those arrows just to hit the bullseye. And when I when, 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 when I take my turn, I let's assume I hit the bullseye 19 times. And the 20th one didn't didn't make it. And then you hit your own arrows and uh, 14 of them hit the target, but, they, but six of them missed the target. 
At the end of the day, both of us miss the mark. I mean, the standard is that you must hit the 20 of them, 20 arrows. You must hit the bullseye with the 20 arrows you have. But if you miss one of them, means that you will miss the mark. You mean, I can be a better sinner than you, which means I sin more. But at the end of the day, whether I'm a better sinner or you are a better sinner, we all miss the mark. We are now in for some... 18. I believe we are in 16, not 18. Therefore, it is a faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him who, whom he believed, God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. So here Paul talks about one of the attributes of God. And that attribute here is omniscient. You see, God knows the end from the beginning. He's telling us about whom Abraham believed. The one that caused the end from the beginning and those things that be not as though they were. It's one of God's attributes. You and I, we don't have this attribute. We don't know everything. If you know everything, <laughs> you will be God. You see, God is not limited by time. He lives in eternal. He lives outside of time frame. You and I, we are prisoners of time. You see, known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. So God will speak about the future, things that are yet to come, as though they are in past tense. We see this in the Bible, in the scriptures, all over the place. You see, the Bible tells us that um, it, it, we are now raised up and seated in high places in Christ Jesus. Tell me, are you now seated in heaven? <laughs> are you not seated here now on earth? But the Bible talks about it because it's something that is going to happen in the future. So it talks about it as though it's in past tense. We see this also in Isaiah chapter 53. If you read that um, uh, 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 chapter, you see that it's Talking about things yet to come, but in past tense. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquity, chastisement of his peace was upon us, by his stripes we are healed. So he's talking about these things as though they have already happened. Things that are yet to come in the future. God speaks to us through his prophets. He tells us about the future through his prophets with 100% accuracy. You see, we have more than 4,000 religions in the world. If someone will say, Do, are you sure? Yeah, we have more than 4,000 religions in the world. And there are about 25 books that claim they are scriptures. You know, from Quran to... Um, uh, 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 the writings of Confucius to Hindu Vedas to the writings of Buddha. But do you know the difference? Every one of there is none of them that has detailed prophecy in it. No, they don't have detailed prophecy. 
Your Bible is one fourth prophecy. That's how much prophecy you have in your Bible. One fourth. God is omniscient. He knows everything, but he tells us the things that we need to know. He reveals them to us. Remember in Deuteronomy 29 verse 29, the secret things belong to our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever. So now, where do we come in? In all of this, where do we come in? Knowing that God is omniscient, we must trust God with our future. That's what, it, that's what I'm saying. We must trust God with our future because he knows the end from the beginning, so he sees all things. You remember Corey Ten Boom. Uh, Corey Ten Boom and her sister were placed in concentration camp. Uh, during the Nazis' uh, regime under Adolfus Hitler, during the Second World War, for hiding Jews in their house. So they were placed in concentration camps. And while they were there, they suffered so many ordeals. But in one of her writings, she said, Never be afraid. To trust a known feature to a known God. Do not be afraid to trust an unknown feature to a known God. We know who God is. You can put all your eggs in God's basket. You know the phraseology, don't put all your eggs in one basket. That doesn't work for God. <laughs> Are you hearing me? It does not work well. God is a... Uh, 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 involved. You can put all your eggs in God's basket and you can go ahead and celebrate. You can go ahead and count all your benefits before they hatch. <laughs> Why? Because they are safe in the hands of God. This is why we do not trust people. We should not. As a matter of fact, you should not be telling people your problems. For the simple reason, about 50% of people you tell your problem, uh, uh, they will not be able to help you. And the other 50% are happy that you got what was coming to you. Even though they may be telling you, I'm sorry to hear about your problem, but I, within them, inside, they are happy. They are excited that you got what was coming to you. So we should put our trust in God who knows the future. He is the only one who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly. He is the only one who can see you through. But you must come to him by faith. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are now in verse um, 18. Who, contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations, According to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. And therefore, it was counted to him for righteousness. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Glory. Hallelujah. Now, if you know the scriptures very well, and you read this section of the Bible, you will be like, uh, uh, I thought Abraham doubted God. Wasn't Abraham who listened to his wife and uh, took Hagar, his male, uh, female servant, and brought forth um, Ishmael? You are correct. You are right. That tells me that you know your Bible very well. 
But what I want to show you here is the difference between doubt and unbelief. You see, Abraham struggled with doubt. Now, doubt is a thing of the head. It is something that is based upon um, intellect, upon uh, what we can see, upon what we can hear. So Abraham struggled with doubt. He struggled with the knowledge that uh, he is about 100 years old and that he ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of a woman. He, she's gone past childbearing age. So he struggled with this doubt within him. Do you know that faith will walk in your heart with doubt in your head? Yeah, you and I, we struggle with this every now and then. As a matter of fact, this is the modus operandi of the enemy. This is how the enemy will try to overthrow your faith. By bringing thoughts in your mind. By bringing some physical manifestations for you to begin to doubt the promises of God. When you are believing God, you will always find out that the enemy is also on the side trying to discourage you. He will bring thoughts in your mind telling you it's not going to work. Why do you think this is going to happen? Don't you see all the odds that are working against you? Whenever you come to this situation, are you going to come to this situation someday? Yes, you will. You will. You will. But this is what you do. When you come to this situation, apply what is said in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. That's what you're going to do. Casting down all imaginations. And every high thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. What are you going to do? When those thoughts, when they come into your mind, you're going to cast them down with what the word of God says. You're going to say, no, I am not going to uh, doubt. This is what the word of God says. And this is what I believe. And this is what will happen. Because God will be there. To always deliver the promises that he made unto me. For he is not a man that he should lie. So this is what we have to always stand by. The word of God. You know friends. The propensity and the proclivity. To go by what we see. Or by what we hear. Is natural to humans. This is why the Bible says we walk by faith. We don't walk by sight. Now, when it comes to unbelief, remember I am telling you now the difference between doubt and unbelief. The problem Abraham had was doubt, which was, which I said, a thing of the head. But unbelief now means that uh, is, uh, unbelief is a thing of the heart. It's a choice. That you have to make. It is you choosing not to believe. Even when you see overwhelming evidence in your face. In your front. That's what unbelief is. Remember the Bible tells us that with the heart. Man believes unto righteousness. And with the mouth. Confession is made unto salvation. So unbelief is a thing of the heart. That was not a problem with Abraham. Because even in the midst of all the struggles that Abraham had, the Bible says he believed God, knowing that him that promised is able to perform that which he promised unto him. So when he was doubting about his age, about the condition of Sarah's womb, he said he, he, he did not overthrow his faith. He was still standing strong. Believing that God is able to make the promises that he made to him to come to pass. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is what we learn from Father Abraham. That regardless of what you see or what you hear, don't be moved. Stand upon the word of God. Stand upon the word of God. The word of God will never fail. Forever it is settled in heaven. 
You remember God said through um, Jeremiah in chapter 32, verse 27. He said, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? No, no. The heaven and earth will pass away, but his own word will never pass away. He is not a man. Whatever he said he would do, he will do. It is impossible for God to lie. So, when you are believing God, and maybe the enemy is bringing thoughts to your heart, to your mind, telling you that it's not going to work, it's too late now, you are hemmed in, what are you going to do? Do not quit. Continue to stand on the promises of God. Because he that promised, blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, he that promised, he is able to perform that which he has promised. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are now in verse um, 23. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him. But also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Who was delivered up because of our offenses. And was raised because of our justification. Here, Paul is telling us that um, God is not a respecter of persons. I'm trying to make sure that we didn't skip any verse. Okay, we did not. So Paul is saying here, he says, God is not a respecter of persons. He says, regardless of your background, whether you were a Jew or you were a Gentile, regardless of your color, whether you were black or white, regardless of your position in the society, whether you belong to the higher class or the lower class. God is not a respecter of person. There is no discrimination with God. Neither is any prejudice found in him. The moment you come to Jesus Christ, the moment you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Bible says, God imputes righteousness to you. That day you become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. But one thing is very important. Understand that before you make this move, it must come from your heart. You must believe. This is the reason why we have some people who are in the church who have prayed a prayer of salvation but they are not born again because it did not come from their heart they pray that prayer to please someone or just to belong to a group god sees the heart of everyone you see all things are naked and open in the eyes of him whom we have to deal with. He sees everything. So he knows those who are genuine. Those who have come to him in faith. And he knows those uh, that are there just to be, uh, uh, oh yes, members. <laughs> you know, just to be there because other people are there. My good friends, Regardless of what you are going through, remember that difficulty is measured by the capacity of the agent that is doing the work. Is any difficulty in God? Do we find any difficulty in God? No, the answer is no. All things are possible with God. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
we I have come to the end of today's teaching. If you're under the sound of my voice, regardless of your location, and if you are not yet born again, or perhaps you wandered away, you walked away from our Lord Jesus Christ, and you want to come back to him today, and you want to be born again today, I'm so glad for you for this is another opportunity. To be born again means that you do not depend upon your self-righteousness, which means your works, your deeds, your merit. But you trust in what Jesus Christ did, that he died on the cross for your sins and that uh, God raised him up from the dead. And then you ask him to come into your life and be your Lord and your Savior and you start a personal relationship with him. That's what it means to be born again. There are so many people who don't understand that phrase. But that's what it means. If you have not done this, today now, today is, the, is another opportunity. The Bible says the day you hear his voice, do not harden your heart, which means do not procrastinate. Do not put it off for tomorrow. The reason is this. Tomorrow is not guaranteed to us. We do not know what tomorrow will bring. You see, David speaking to Jonathan said, there is only but one step between me and death. Just in the word, today, about a 150,000 people died. That's about two people every second. Where did they go? Remember, every being is a spiritual being. Which means when you die or when your spirit leaves the body, the spirit continues to live on and on. A spirit can never die. Even though this body may fall flat, but the spirit continues to live. And there are only two locations for the spirit to spend eternity. Is it that he goes up to heaven? If that one met Jesus Christ, his or her Lord or Savior, while they were still alive. Or that spirit will go down to hell and spend eternity there. You see, when I bring you the gospel, I tell you all about it. There is a place called hell. Those who reject Jesus Christ here on earth will spend eternity in hell. Now, hell is a place of torture, torment, place of darkness, where people will burn with fire and brimstone forever and ever. It is not a place that you want to go. But there is time today, an opportunity right now to change your course in life, to repent, to turn from going to hell to going to heaven. So you are the one who's going to make the decision. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Don't put it off any longer. Don't say, let me go and get ready. Let me get my acts together. No, you could not. If you could, Jesus would not have died for you and I. Jesus wants us to come as we are. When we come, he loves us so much to leave us the way we came to him. He's going to clean us up. And when he does that, his spirit will live in us. Now to help us to live a better life. A life that is empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. So if you're hearing my voice, you are the one to make that decision because you and I, we are created as free mortal entities. We have the right to make choices in life and God will not restrain us from making those choices. One of the choices is to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. And you can make that choice today. Your parents will not be able to make the choice for you. 
Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and I will eat with him and he will eat with me. This tells you that uh, you are the one who's going to make that decision. Jesus said, if you do not believe that I am he, the Messiah, you will die in your sins. Anyone who believes in the Son of God has life already. But if anyone who doesn't believe, the Bible tells us the wrath of God is upon that one already. He will not see life. Do not say that I belong to this religion or the other religion that we all believe in God and all roads lead to heaven. That is deception. It is not true. The Bible tells us that it's either you go through Jesus or you don't go into heaven at all. You cannot select the Father and then reject Jesus. It doesn't work that way. The two go together. And Jesus makes this even clearer to us when he says in John chapter 14 verse 6 I am the way the truth and the life no one comes to the father but by me which means he is the only way to heaven I want to lead you now into salvation by praying this simple prayer with you if you pray this prayer and you mean it with all your heart right now you will be transformed your spirit will be recreated. You will become a child of God. And if you would die today, you will spend eternity with God in heaven. Pray this prayer with me. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. I believe that he is your son. He died for my sins. And you raise him up from the dead on the third day. Dear Jesus Christ, I ask you this day to come into my life and be my Lord and my Savior. By faith now, I believe that my sins are washed away. My name is written in the Lamb's book of life. I turn away from my evil ways and I turn to you, my Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. If you pray that prayer, congratulations. You are now a child of God. I welcome you into the kingdom of God. Please find a good church where they teach the word of God. So you can become a member of that church and be taught the word of God. Because the only way that you can grow in your faith is through the word of God. That's why Peter said, desire the sincere milk of the word of God that you may grow thereby. You do not want the enemy to take advantage of what just happened now in your life. So I want you to buy a Bible. Study the word of God. Depend upon the Holy Spirit of God to give you enlightenment and understanding of the scriptures. Because every scripture was inspired by him. So he knows how to bring the scriptures life unto your heart. I want to use this opportunity to thank our, our partners all over the world. Those that are helping us spread the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ in, in, in so many ways through their uh, 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 prayers, their uh, 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 financial support, and through their services. If you want to be a partner to this ministry, please go to our website. It is kuim.org. Remember, it is only those who hear the gospel, the word of God, and they put the word of God into practice. We call them the doers of the word of God. They are the only ones who get the benefits of the word of God. I pray for you, my friends, today. May the Lord bless you and be always with you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you wisdom. Wisdom to make sound decisions in your life. And give you health in your bodies. And give you divine health. May the Lord open doors of opportunities for you. May he give you all things that are necessary for your spiritual life. May he stand your feet upon that rock which is higher than you. May he de deliver you from the 
destructions of the enemy. May his angels always encamp around about you. May he bless the rest of your week and give you financial freedom in the name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said, Amen. My good friends, regardless of your situation and what you're going through, always remember this, there is always an end. Surely there is an end. And your expectations will never be cut off. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Baruch Hashem Adonai. Laskana unguru pades te kia alalama shariara patut. Gundamene credes te kusko baratiara. Ala banglanda magendo loco brocoto vuskele petele gesele crocusco pala pate. Ah, jagala bagala gasha kala pacata sulo coto brocoto bile kele sala kala fatut. Men lene grandem sulo coto brocoto bojeke ala basso coto locosco bar endele maso patit. Ala ganglanda mingre jes 